Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katie Parks Green. I'm the Assistant Director for George Mason University School of Business Advancement and Alumni Relations team. Welcome to the Mason Collective Impact Summer Speaker Series. Thank you so much for joining us. Just a few logistical notes to get us started. By joining this webinar, you have the opportunity to interact with today's moderators and speakers in the Q&A box, which will be checked throughout the presentation and addressed periodically through typed responses or during the Q&A portion at the end of today's event. Today's webinar will be recorded. A link will be sent out to all attendees in the days following the event. If you have any questions or concerns during the webinar, please send a direct chat message to me, Katie Park Screen, during the event. Again, thank you for joining us. I'd now like to introduce our School of Business Dean, Maury Piperl, who will kick off our event. Thank you for participating today, Maury. Pleasure. Thank you, Katie, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I'm Maury Piper. As Katie said, I've been Dean of the School of Business here for three years now, and one of the things that has always impressed me about Mason, but that we don't, let's say, brag enough about, is our expertise and the impact that that expertise has and can have in the wider world. So I'd like to welcome you to the second installment of our Mason Collective Impact series. This was started uh, a year ago, more than a year ago, by the College of Science and the School of Business, and we're particularly pleased to present this afternoon's session not only in collaboration between science and business, but also in collaboration with the College of Humanities and Social Sciences and the College of Health and Human Services, which frankly shows you how interdisciplinary Mason is as a university and can be. The purpose of the series, a few things. First of all, it's a forum to explore a diverse set of areas of public interest, things which matter and cross disciplines. Second, it's a, it's a place for us to discuss important issues that really will have a significant impact on the future of our region and our world. So the big picture, important stuff. And of course, as I was hinting at, it's explicitly a place for us to introduce the wider community to the expertise that Mason has, and particularly to introduce those thought leaders, the people behind the ideas whom you'll see and hear from today. We're bringing together expert practitioners and researchers, and that's something that Mason is particularly good at. We hope that this afternoon, it will help you develop a better understanding of the theme about America's health landscape, innovators, advocates, and providers, and certainly nothing is more important and no time more essential to have uh, this conversation. So today's agenda includes seven speakers, each will present for eight minutes talking about their particular interest in one aspect of health. Uh, while that's happening, feel, please feel free to place your questions in the chat box on Zoom. They'll be moderated by Nikki Jerome and Evan Del Duke. We're also using social media to capture the goings on at the uh, event here. And that hashtag is hashtag Mason Nation Impact. We're going to record the event as well. It'll be on the YouTube channel uh, for future viewing. Uh, if you want to spread the word, if you enjoy it, that would be great. So let's get started to learn more about America's health landscape. I want to thank all my colleagues for putting this together and turn it over to Evan. Thank you very much, Dean Piper. Um, our first speaker today uh, for America's health landscape and the Mason Collective Impact is Dr. Monique Van Hope, who will be talking about antibiotic resistance how Komodo dragons and alligators can defeat superbugs. Dr. Monique Van Hoek joined George Mason University's College of Science in August 2002. She was among the first faculty members to join the newly formed National Center for Biodefense and Infectious Diseases. Her research program is actively focused in two areas, um, predominantly around biofilms and small molecule communication in Francisella, and discovering and developing new novel antimicrobial peptides to fight against multi-drug resistant and bio-threat bacteria, particularly in gram-negative uh, bacteria. Dr. Van Hoek has published more than 50 papers and has led or co-led many large research projects, including projects funded by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, the Office of Naval Research, as well as Virginia's Commonwealth Research Commercialization Fund. Please welcome Dr. Monique Van Hoek. Thank you, Evan. Thank you very much. So as Evan said, um, I'm going to talk about Komodo dragons and alligators and how they can help us defeat superbugs. Um, my name is Monique Van Hook. I've been at George Mason since 2002, and I'm a professor in the School of Systems Biology at our SciTech campus. Um, so I wanted to talk to you today about antibiotic resistance. 
I know we're in the middle of a global viral pandemic, but this is another threat standing right behind that one as a serious threat to our, our um, health and welfare as a, as a species. This is a global threat. So antibiotic resistance is spreading all around the world right now, and we don't even know the full impact of this. Uh, we don't track it particularly well, um, but we know that it's getting um, worse and worse each year. And without urgent action, uh, the, the things that we take for granted about modern medicine, like cancer treatment, uh, surgeries, organ transplants, chemotherapy, um, these things might not be possible for us. And, and this could turn even common infections into deadly threats to our lives. So what is antibiotic resistance? I'm not gonna go into all the details, but basically it's when bacteria either have or they get from another bacteria the ability to destroy, remove, or inactivate antibiotics. And we call these superbugs. So most people have heard of MRSA, which is one of the superbugs, and this stands for methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and it is a very commonly occurring drug-resistant bacteria. And there are many more uh, different uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria, and some of them are multi-drug resistant, so resistant to more than one class of antibiotics. So, so why is this a, a real problem? What's the bigger problem? Well, the, the bigger problem is that as people acquire these infections, they get seriously ill with these infections, there are no antibiotics left in the pipeline to treat these patients. There are one or two drugs of last, antibiotics of last resort, but those have terrible side effects, kidney failure, deafness, and even death as a side effect of the drug. So these are not good options. According to the CDC, we have almost 3 million cases each year in the United States of drug-resistant infections, and currently about 35,000 people in the US die from these infections. And as I said, we probably are under-measuring um, this problem. So it's a super serious problem, and we and other scientists, uh, we here at Mason and other scientists really want to contribute a solution to this problem. Now, can bacteria actually kill you? Just to, I just wanted to remind you that bacteria can actually kill you. If we think about another pandemic in history, the Black Death, this pandemic killed a third of the population of Europe and a half the population of Eurasia in a period of about five years and it lingered on for centuries. So bacteria can be very, very deadly. Uh, just as a side note, I put this picture of a plague doctor up here. You might have seen this before, but I put it here today just to point out that uh, this is another example of mask wearing in a pandemic. It's a good idea. Anyway, moving on. Uh, but uh, experts now think though that drug-resistant bacteria uh, are emerging at such a rate that uh, soon they will cause more deaths even than cancer. So this bubble graph shows you global deaths now, not US, but global deaths. And you can see cholera, measles, diabetes, road traffic accidents, and cancer, which is currently about eight and a half million people per year worldwide. Currently, antimicrobial resistant infections cause almost a million deaths per year, but we think that uh, within less than 25 years, we will have more than 10 million deaths uh, caused by, by drug-resistant and multi-drug-resistant infections. This includes skin infections, wound infections, multi-drug-resistant tuberculosis, etc. So it's a very serious problem. So you're thinking probably, well, they'll just make new antibiotics, right? No problem. Well, there is an extreme severe market failure in the antibiotic marketplace and in the development of new antibiotics. So in this graph, you can see that um, the line of increasing drug resistance goes up. This is MRSA, this is vancomycin resistant enterococcus, this is pseudomonas, there are many other anti uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria whose incidence is going up and up and up. But this red line is the uh, approval of new antibiotics through the FDA, and it, the same red line would be drawn for the number of new drugs in the pipeline, new antibiotics in the pipeline. And you can see that this graph is going in the wrong direction. I could talk for an hour with you about all the different uh, market forces and problems and issues that there are with uh, why we don't make more new antibiotics, but you can see there's a severe mismatch. 
So scientists like myself uh, who work on bacteria and bacterial infections, a lot of us have decided to devote some of our time to trying to solve this problem or at least contribute a solution. And the solution that I'm going to talk to you about today is antimicrobial peptides. So this is a form of an antibacterial compound. So what are antimicrobial peptides? Well, I put a picture of one right here that we invented. Uh, they're very small bits of protein. Uh, they occur naturally in the bodies of humans and higher animals as part of our innate immune system. So we can make peptides that are antibacterial, antifungal, and antiviral. And this is part of how we survive the onslaught from the outside world. These peptides can act directly on pathogens or they can stimulate your immune system so that you have a more robust ability to defend. And in addition to natural peptides, we can make synthetic peptides. We can make them in the lab and invent and design them to have uh, properties against bacteria that we're very worried about, like these drug resistant bacteria. And I put this big green arrow here because this is where I spend most of my time now is to invent and discover new peptides and what makes these peptides work better against highly drug resistant or dangerous bacteria. So far, we and others have been quite successful. We have found synthetic peptides that are active in wound healing, activating the immune response, showing antiviral activity and antibacterial activity against some of these pathogens that I've talked to you about. So how do we find these peptides? Where do we go looking for these things? So scientists often go to nature and we went and looked in amazing animals like the Komodo dragon shown here and the American alligator shown here. We've also found new peptides in snakes and in bed bugs. And we go to nature to get uh, inspiration, to get these animals have been successful and active on the planet for millions of years and their bodies have selected uh, peptides that are very strong and powerful and able to help us um, cure these infections. So we go bioprospecting, we call it. We use our technologies of nanomaterials, mass spectrometry, and advanced biochemistry to look at nature and then to make uh, synthetic peptides inspired by those. So along with my colleague, Dr. Barney Bishop in chemistry, we have this process called bioprospecting where we get a small drop of blood, we identify peptides, we test them in the lab, and then we have peptides that hopefully will help us with these infections. We use nanomaterials like these nanoparticles shown here to harvest the peptides. And then we have discovered peptides that are active against multidrug resistant bacteria, useful in infected wounds and wound healing, and even against biothreat bacteria, which might be multidrug resistant. So in summary, I hope to explain to you a little bit about antimicrobial peptides, how they're a new source of antibiotics, we use our bioprospecting to discover new peptides, and we, then we invented and designed new peptides to help us fight the superbugs. We hope to commercialize these and work with infectious disease physicians as we go forward. I just want to thank my collaborators, the animals that gave us a little bit of blood, the humans who've worked with us on this project, and our sponsor, which is DITRA. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. That was great. Thanks, Nikki. All right, we'll go to our next speaker. Um, I'm really happy to introduce to us, uh, to the crowd today, uh, Sharon Lamberton and her presentation, The Value of Medicines and the Industry's Role in Fighting the Pandemic. Ms. Lamberton serves as the Deputy Vice President of State Policy for the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers Association of America, a tra trade association of 35 biopharmaceutical companies. She provides policy analysis and support, clinical expertise, and strategy for multiple industry-related issues, such as cost and value of medicines, adherence, access to insulin, prescription drug abuse, Use in clinical trials. Ms. Lamberton also holds a master's in health systems management from Mason. Welcome, Shannon. Thanks. Thank you, Nikki. I want to thank you, um, Shannon, Katie, Evan, and Dean Piperall for this great program today. It's an honor to be on with many of the other speakers today. And following Dr. Hoke's presentation was terrific. In fact, I'm happy to segue into what our industry is doing in addition to fighting the pandemic. We recently launched 
Antimicrobial Resistance Action Fund, which is a commitment to come up with two to four new antimicrobial agents by 2030. It's a billion dollar commitment of our industry and I'm very proud of that. Next slide will show you a little bit about what our industry is doing. Pharma is the trade association of about 35 biopharmaceutical companies bringing brand name cures and treatments to patients all over the world. You can see I took four different disease states. As a nurse, I love neurology and I started out at, uh, my career at NIH. And so to see that we had the first ever pill for MS, we had the first ever cure for hepatitis. It used to be a long debilitating condition, but now in 12 weeks, you can have a cure for most hepatitis cases, which is just a blessing. Cancer death rates have dropped 26 to 27% since 1990. And if you are diagnosed with cancer, you have a chance of living five years or more, which has increased by 41% since 1975. And just, just amazing advances. The next slide, however, captures how risky and expensive it is to bring a drug to market. I wish we were making ice cream. We are not. We are making very difficult compounds. And to hear that there are 88% of the medicines do not make it from bench to bedside, 12% do, is astounding. I'm not a business major, but I know that if I had that success rate of only 12% success, it would be difficult to invest in such a venture. That's why it's so important that our policies on both the state and federal level are strong. You see how many um, attempts there are in Alzheimer's, 123 attempts and only four just made it. It takes 10 to 12 years to bring that drug from bench to bedside in 2.6 billion. So as we face the pandemic, these are important facts and figures to keep in mind because the race and the importance of coming up with a treatment and a vaccine has never been greater, but we do face those hurdles and that's something to consider. The next slide talks about the three different phases that have to go through as a manufacturer through FDA for safety and approval. I wish this could be expedited, it's not, but it's for our safety and for the family members and the friends that we all have around us because this safety is essential that each of those phases are carefully evaluated and, um, and monitored by the FDA. I'm here today to talk about the next slide, which launches into what are we doing as an industry to beat this pandemic? We've never seen an enemy like this before. We've also never been as collaborative as we have been. We are 35 different member companies that quite frankly are competitive. We have to share. We have to share information. And I have never seen in my 18 years of working with pharma, never seen such a collaborative spirit. And this is not just member company to member company. It's also with NIH, World Health Organization. It's with CDC. It's with the Chinese government. It's with the European Medicines Association. We are working closely, collaborating, sharing best practices, because we must. We're looking at screening current libraries of medicines that we have, things already on the shelf, like antimicrobials and antiviral agents that might work to help fight coronavirus, either a treatment or a vaccine development. We are also investing billions of dollars into the R&D, and I'll talk a moment in about the uh, clinical trials that we have underway. And again, we're expanding manufacturing. I had never understood the extent of planning for manufacturing that our companies do. Years in advance before a medicine is even approved, they start developing and even building buildings and facilities for which those medicines can be approved. So we are doing quite a bit in that area. And the next slide talks about the different factors of our industry's response. And I've touched on a bit of that, but we are also in the diagnostic space. We're investing billions in diagnostics. We are looking at vaccines. This is important because on the earlier slide, I said that 12% make it. Of vaccines, only 5% make it. So we have a much greater chance of failing. So that means we need more shots on goal, literally. We need more attempts if we're gonna have a vaccine. You might have seen some information today from the WHO estimating that in early 2021, we will see a vaccine. I'm hopeful it'll be before then, but those clinical trials we just talked about are musts. We have to go through and make sure whatever we develop is safe before it's injected into humans. We are in the third phase of clinical trials, human trials, 
in uh, some of our vaccines and treatments for coronavirus and not one has failed. So that is good news today. Next slide talks about how many clinical trials are actually going on. This number just changed from Sunday when I sent Nikki my slides. It's now 1,358. I'm so happy to see those clinical trial numbers going up because 300 of those are here in the US. And among those, we see um, that it, about 71 are actually now, today's number 71 are actual uh, vaccinations under investigation right now. We have great collaborations. We have things looking at trying single dose vaccines. We're looking at um, stimulating using RNA um, to make the body create more proteins and provoke a, a immune system reaction, almost like they're being invaded by the virus so the body will react and defend against itself. And then finally, looking at things like adjuvants to enhance the immune system. Next slide we'll look at shows all the different approaches to vaccines. I won't get into that because of time. However, the next slide does talk about, again, the time frame. Don't let this scare you because I do have hope that this will be sooner than 18 to 24 months. But we see on the far right that failure rate that 5 to 10 percent are only likely to succeed for vaccines. Vaccines are difficult, much more difficult than an average compound or treatment. However, I think that's going to be our answer. We're already underway. You see the news articles today about arguments of how you're going to disseminate fairly the vaccination. How do you make sure the most vulnerable get it? The healthcare workers and then whom? So this is going to be a huge debate among our college that George Mason can contribute in with the incredible faculty that we have, the students, the alumni that already work in the fields. Really exciting that we can be part of that debate um, at George Mason and around the community to talk about such ethical, important decisions. And then finally, affordability is gonna be a piece because a lot of our companies, while they have pledged to make it affordable, again, you've seen the costs invest. So we, can't, we have to recoup our investment. Even Dr. Fauci said, you know, I've never seen the manufacturers gouge in a pandemic, but we realize they need to recoup investment. So we'll see how this plays out. It'll be interesting, but first let's get that vaccine and treatment. Next slide just talks about how many are in different states. We have clinical trials in 45 different states. If anybody asks you among family, friends, or colleagues, how do you enroll? Because we actually need um, 30,000 uh, trial participants in four different trials by mid-August. So we are recruiting healthy adults. These are our companies. So if anybody wants to know, I can give you more information offline, but clinicaltrials.gov is an important resource. And then finally, looking at the next slides, these are resources. These are our folks that are already involved in this. The next slide, most importantly, tells you about MAT, Medication Assistance Tool, which is a repository, one-stop shopping, 900 to 950 public or private programs that offer free or nearly free medicines to those that need it. The next slide, just talking about how simple it is. It gives information to patients. You just type in the name of the medicine and we will get that medicine to you or your healthcare provider. And finally, the last slide talks about Healthcare Ready, an important resource that was started after Hurricane Katrina, funded by our industry, but collaborated with AMA, with the American Red Cross and others. They serve an important resource during this time of pandemic, should you not be able to get your prescription or afford it. Thank you so much for your time. I'll look forward to the Q&As. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lamberton, for your uh, extremely interesting insights in the pharmaceutical industry and how we're responding to the coronavirus. Thanks. Our next speaker um, will be talking about the use of virtual care and telehealth to combat the COVID-19 and transform care delivery. Mr. Rod Cruz currently serves as AT&T's healthcare customers uh, as the healthcare solutions general manager. His team is responsible for developing corporate healthcare strategy, go-to-market approach, sales execution, and creation of industry solutions for providers, payers, pharmaceuticals, and de medical device manufacturers. Please welcome Mr. Rod Cruz. Thank you, Evan. Uh, wonderful to be here with everyone and Sharon really enjoyed your presentation and um, great to see the collaboration in the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, we can all agree that the vaccine can't get here soon enough. Uh, my topic for today will be around telehealth and, uh, and how it's really been interacting with 
the current pandemic environment. If we move to the next slide, um, I want to I want to just hit some high level trends uh, from a telehealth perspective. Most patients, almost 100%, 97% of all patients are very satisfied with their telehealth, telemedicine experience. Uh, and uh, obviously once um, they kind of break the seal, as we've seen recently, as we're all doing these collaboration tools we're engaged in, um, the patients are very, very satisfied with the, uh, with the experience. Uh, our friends from Global Data uh, Analyst Group tells us that they expect to see uh, 2x the growth over the next five years in telehealth uh, across the industry. And then um, the really the big takeaway is that almost 75% of all medical appointments could be virtually managed and cared for uh, in that platform. So um, it's one of the ones that really is a driver. So really the opportunity is there. And then I'll close this particular slide by, uh, by making sure we understand how much of the 2.2 trillion dollar uh, CARES Act was allocated towards adopting telemedicine across the country. And that number is 200 million. Um, I'm aware as of a couple of weeks ago, um, all the applications have been, um, have been vetted and uh, the $200 million have been allocated. But again, um, a lot of really a wonderful stage to really drive adoption from a telehealth perspective in our industry. If we can move to the next slide. I do think that um, COVID-19 has been really a, a catalyst, a spark plug, uh, a lot of different um, use cases that have been specific to COVID-19. So as I move through the presentation, I hope that you get to see that it's, it hasn't just been um, a patient visit um, in, which, in which telehealth has been used over the last 90 days, but it has, it has really spawned up some innovation and different approaches to how telehealth is being used. And so we'll get into the, some of the detail on the next slide. So what are some of the major drivers? And it really has been a, a, a confluence of uh, several things. Early in January of this year, uh, CMS did change uh, the reimbursement rules around both remote patient monitoring and telehealth, removing some of the, some of the uh, rural healthcare, some of the rural uh, restrictions. And so in January, really the whole fundamental economic model changed in terms of an ROI and reimbursement. So that was, that was very good news. COVID hits in the middle of March, uh, and that's obviously dri driven a lot of more adoption in terms of being able to provide virtual care. I referenced earlier in the previous slide the $200 million that had been allocated and earmarked for telehealth adoption. And at the end, you know, we really believe this is going to improve the quality of care. And again, we go back to that statistic from the previous slide when I referenced it all, almost 75% of all patient visits could be done virtually. So you blend all of these together and it does just create a perfect storm uh, for really greater adoption from a telehealth perspective. Again, not new technology. This technology has been around for over a decade, but just in terms of the growth that we're going to see and the utilization of this wonderful technology uh, will continue to grow and increase over the, over the upcoming months and years. We move to the next slide. Uh, this is basically a slide that covers um, telehealth is part of the virtual care platform, because if you look at um, what telehealth can offer, it really can be the, the, the office visit replacement. And you can see there are some of the characteristics um, that we use to define what really is the, the, the most common uh, uh, capability that a telemedicine, telehealth platform should deliver. So we go into multi-party video. That means that you could have a consultation with multiple caregivers. It's obviously very secure. Um, it obviously looks at HIPAA, high tech, PHI type of protocols to ensure any data that's, uh, that's traversing the solution is secure. Uh, you can have an automated phone call. You can create a call queue. You can generate patient alerts. You've got task assignments for the caregiver. So their to-do list at the end of the session or during the session. There's escalation pathways. And obviously uh, being able to monitor and manage and measure the time of the call for reimbursement pay purposes. So um, those are what we believe from our point of view are some of the minimal criteria that you would need to really, uh, quote unquote, have a telehealth uh, session. But then if you do that and you couple that with almost remote patient monitoring to be able to not only manage um, what you do within the office visit, but in between the visits, uh, move over to um, sharing that information with other, other families um, and, and other providers, with other questionnaires and surveys and different types of information that can be shared, 
and even adherence to protocols. That's really an, an entire end-to-end -end virtual care platform, but obviously it does begin with telehealth. If we move on to the next slide, this would be, again, uh, just a comment, all telehealth solutions are not created equal. When the pandemic hit, we saw a lot of different flavors and sizes and shapes of telehealth um, being stood up. Um, not all of them really met some of the criteria that I covered in the previous slide, but obviously being able to um, have the, you see here the patient vitals, the actual interaction with the caregiver, secure, uh, being able to create those patient cues, the, the, the notifications, et cetera. Those are what we believe are basically a, a, a minimal uh, common denominator that you must have to have a telehealth, a telehealth telemedicine session. On the next slide, um, this is one that we uh, saw stood up um, in many hospitals with the surge that was taking place as uh, COVID-19 patients uh, were being treated. Um, obviously, some were uh, no vaccine, no treatment. They could maybe just be sent home. But there were some hospitals that created COVID-19 wings, and then nurses and caregivers created virtual rounds where um, you could create a nurse dashboard in a centralized location in the hospital, and they would be monitoring and establishing telehealth sessions uh, with patients within the hospital without exposing the caregivers to the, to the patients to be able to be part of their containment strategy. So again, you see here a screenshot of what a, uh, a nurse dashboard would look like in these virtual waiting rooms. Again, just an example of a, uh, of a new uh, COVID-19 use case that telehealth brought about. On the next slide, we go into a Holy Name, which is a provider um, uh, up in the Northeast in New Jersey that um, they really created, uh, again, new work streams, new delivery uh, models of care, uh, in which telehealth was um, right in the middle of it, in the heart of it. So the patients and the staff would download uh, the Holy Name app. It would had a pre-built COVID-19 screening survey, so maybe the five or six, seven questions that the CDC provides. And then based on that, they triaged based on the responses. So based on responses of telehealth sessions, patients were directed either to stay at home, um, maybe they, if they had deployed uh, an RPM solution to be able to monitor remotely, or then if needed, they would then be admitted to uh, the ICU unit for treatment and care. So again, um, in closing, um, I think telehealth, again, technology has been around for over a decade. Um, those different major, uh, major trends have really created a, a, a really great set of adoption. We are expecting CMS to continue to, quit, to, continue to modify the reimbursement rules. And then also uh, you could see some of the use cases that are being stood up in terms of being able to address the current pandemic environment where telehealth will continue. So from an AT&T business perspective, uh, we see that telehealth um, is not only going to be something we're using in the middle of the pandemic, it will have staying power. And you can see with information and use cases, as you see in front of you with Holy Name, that um, you know, there's going to be a lot of innovation being driven by this. Uh, and again, we hope to see that uh, telehealth is maybe the first step of a much, much broader virtual care platform that's deployed within the industry. Thank you very much. I think that's my presentation. Thank you, Rod. That was really fascinating. Um, and as somebody who's used telehealth, I really enjoyed it. So thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome Brad Greenwood, who's going to speak about the health implications of digitalization. Uh, Dr. Greenwood is an Associate Professor of Information Systems and Operations Management in the School of Business. His research examines and intends an, uh, the intended and unintended consequences of innovation and how access to the resulting information affects welfare at the interface between business, technology, and social issues, notably in the context of healthcare and entrepreneurship. He is currently an Associate Editor at Management Science. Welcome, Brad Greenwood. All right. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming today. Um, so he said, uh, my name is Brad Greenwood. Uh, I'm an associate prof at the business school. Uh, and I'd like to talk to you today about some of the health implications of digitization. So it'll be a little light on COVID. Um, I think when, when we talk about digitization in the business context, a lot of it is motivated by the fact that the world is getting a lot smaller. Uh, and I don't think that's a controversial statement. And it's being made smaller by a lot of things. You think about electrification of the world, uh, which makes people able to be productive irrespective of local resources. You think about the internal combustion engine, which you know, we can now move people, resources, 
uh, across vast distances that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise. You think about radio technology, have seamless communication, which is completely devoid of, of, of boundary. And the internet, kind of from a business perspective, is the culmination of all of that, and that we now have seamless connectivity, which is basically global. And as a business school, or as you know, information systems economists, we've looked at a lot of different implications of the internet and, and the rise in connectivity that it affords. Downfall of the newspaper industry, the rise of globalization of outsourcing, and outsourcing the, uh, the platform-based economy. But I think one that gets shied away from a little bit is the effect of healthcare. And that's a lot of what my work tries to do, uh, is looking at these intended and unintended consequences of innovation, specifically in the healthcare space, and looking at how it affects welfare at the intersection of business, technology, and society. Because if you, if you think about the rod of Aeschylus, it's, it's really no longer a physician taking notes about a patient. Right? It's ones and zeros that are vastly interconnected across an entire, a, a global, or at this point, a national, and hopefully soon a globally integrated repository of information on patient behavior. Right, so um, the reason why I want to talk about the digitization of society is that you know, we do have a healthcare crisis in the United States, and it isn't COVID-19. I mean, COVID-19 is very, very bad. Uh, it will go away someday. Uh, but I think there are underlying problems, like many of the talks have highlighted, that, that are going to persist. The one that really keeps me up at night is, you know, according to Johns Hopkins, medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the United States. And that's, that's a staggering observation is you know we have heart disease cancer and then medical errors and that that's a shocking idea right so it's 9.5 percent of deaths in the united states it's 2.5 boeing dreamliners crashing every day uh, and given that two boeing planes going down was enough to stop boeing uh for more than a year that i think this is relatively shocking how numb we are to this foundational issue and and it's worse for social outgroups so you consider you know uh, black babies are three times more likely to perish than white newborns uh, upon birth. Women are far more likely to perish if they have a heart attack, even though men and women have heart attacks at roughly equal rates. These are kind of astounding facts to realize. But what I think is in IT, we have a solution to some of these problems because IT does some things that other things don't do, right? So IT enforces processes, right? So we can see if people are adhering to best practices or if they're deviating from best practices. That also allows us to do experimentation with what best practices should be. IT allows intra and extra organizational visibility. So we can see information, we can centralize information within the organization, or we can pool information across organizations and begin monitoring health issues as they come. It also facilitates rigorous statistical analysis, and I think, you know, as an IS economist, this is the thing that, that really makes me excited, because if we're not trying to analyze these things rigorously to see if there's an effect, we're, we're really no better than medieval doctors and their leeches, right? Sometimes we make a, a treatment, sometimes the patient gets better, sometimes it gets worse, but we don't really know, so we're just shooting in the dark, and, and that's not effective. All right, so let's dig into this problem of racial bias. I'll we'll talk about one of the papers uh, that was recently published in Management Science. Uh, a large body of research has documented racial disparities in healthcare. Uh, so it comes down to amputations, surgical interventions. In all of these things, you have systemic inequality uh, across race. And there's a lot of reasons for it. Uh, patient provider issues of trust are certainly there, provider bias and assessment. Well, if we think about this from kind of an operations management information system standpoint, one thing that we could do to minimize these issues is to standardize the information gathering process, right? And a tool that we can do that with is something like a clinical decision support system, right? So that's the research question in this paper, you know, what's the effect of uh, CDSS support on amputation rates uh, across black and white patients for diabetes mellitus? Right? And diabetes, we look at specifically, diabetes is a huge issue in the United States, and it's extremely costly from a policy perspective. And, you know, once diabetes progresses to the point of cell necrosis, you really have two options, right? You can either amputate the tissue, you can remove it primarily, or you can attempt to revascularize it. And the problem that we face is that there are wildly differing rates in, uh, at which black and white patients have their limbs or feet amputated below the nape, right? Far more likely to get a revascularization uh, if you're a white patient. Well, intuitively, if we begin to standardize processes, can we begin to bring that down? That's an interesting S-anti question, right? 
So the data that we use to test this comes from uh, the age group survey for Maryland, Florida, and California. They're large and economically diverse states. And what's nice about this experimental setup is that you have this phased implementation of CDSS systems across different hospitals in different times. And what that allows us to do is run what's called a difference of difference estimation. And I assume that nobody wants me to get into the stats, so I won't, but I'm very happy to talk about it afterwards. Right? So what we do is we compare the change in hospital amputation rates in hospitals that receive this treatment, the CDSS, against those that don't. Right? And what we see is there's a significant penalty to black patients. They're far more likely to have their limbs amputated, but as soon as you implement a CDSS, that number gets cut in half. So you're actually able to drastically reduce the amputation disparity just by digitizing the process. And that effect is evident even in the absence of Caucasian patients. Now, one of my colleagues, Dr. Bellos, is out there right now, and I know he's laughing at me that, you know, in front of all the alumni, I'm going to make a fool of myself. Right? But this actually holds up to quite a bit of empirical scrutiny. So if you look at this thing in relative time, right, you normalize based on the period of adoption, which is right there at the center, period of adoption, you see that the trends are relatively consistent across black and white patients prior to implementation. But then you have this dropout in the rate of amputation for black patients immediately after adoption. That does suggest some normalization. Moreover, you can begin to look at which benefits patients benefit most, right? So you would say, oh, the amputation decision has a lot of things going on in it. Well, it actually, the benefit accrues really on the margin where patients are uh, on the halfway point between an amputation and a revascularization. It's striking because it says, okay, the marginal patient that's difficult to assess, these systems are actually affecting them. So in this paper, you know, we find that enterprise IT can reduce racial bias and benefits of enterprise IT in hospitals are, are unbelievable. They reduce fragmentation, they decrease rates of drug-drug interactions, they decrease medication errors, right, and do it at significantly less cost. If you just think about the patient monitoring that's been going on in COVID-19, this would not be possible without something like enterprise systems. This pooling of data is what allows us to do these things. Right? And it's not just about medicine. This is something that is happening in government, in law, in human rights. So I will simply say to you, in God we trust, all others bring data if you take one thing away from this talk. Thank you very much, Brad. That was very interesting. Uh, a lot to look forward to and a variety of different issues um, that face um, with the emergence of digitization. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Mona Sarfiti. Uh, and her talk title is Climate Solutions Are Health Solutions. Dr. Sarfiti uh, is the founder and director of the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health in the Mason Center for Climate Change Communication. The program brings together physicians and other health professionals from around the country to inform the public and policymakers about the health harms of climate change and the health benefits of climate solutions. Dr. Sarfiti is an author of widely circulated guides and articles on how to increase cancer screening rates in practice and on improving practice outcomes by using the features of the patient-centered medical home. She has a textbook and an ebook coming out in October on climate change and population health. Please welcome Dr. Mona Sarfiti. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and um, my background is that I'm a family physician and also public health trained uh, and founded this uh, coalition of medical societies and other public health organizations a few years ago. And I'm going to be talking about the health harms of climate change and tell stories of four physicians and what they've experienced directly uh, and uh, talk about the underlying dynamics of the harms uh, of a warming planet with a rising carbon dioxide content in our atmosphere. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what the consortium is doing about it and also about the health benefits of climate solutions. So the first story is that of Dr. Samantha Adut, who's a pediatrician in Northern Virginia, um, whose son was uh, at band camp playing the clarinet when he collapsed. Parents called to the emergency room um, and uh, very upsetting, obviously. Turned out he had heat illness. Um, and uh, this was a wake-up call for Dr. Adut, who since that time, this was 2011, since that time has been working on problems around climate change and started a group in Virginia that's affiliated with us called Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action. Um, another uh, impact of climate change related to the heat is drought. 
which predisposes to wildfires and decreased food crops and water shortages, shortages in some areas of the country and the world. Um, and this is the story of Dr. John Meredith, who's an emergency physician in Eastern Carolina University, uh, who was there in 2008 when there was a devastating fire uh, that started in a bog. Uh, he thought he was seeing more patients in his emergency room who came in not only with lung complaints, but also with heart problems. And he and some colleagues decided to study this systematically, and they compared the counties of the state that got the plume of smoke to those that didn't. Um, and they found that those counties that got the plume not only had higher rates of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, that's COPD and asthma, but also pneumonia and bronchitis, uh, and had more heart attacks and episodes of heart failure. Uh, so air pollution uh, is another impact of climate change, and that comes from fire, as we were just discussing. It also comes from smog because heat and light act on any fumes that are in the air and they turn them into ozone. And ozone is a directly irritating gas that affects the lungs and also the eyes and nose. Um, and, um, and so it's much worse on hot days. And then we have a spread of the pollen producing plants related to climate change. And uh, many of the pollen uh, and pollens are actually very small particles and can get deep into the lungs and cause problems for people. Um, and so all three of these together mean more lung problems. And you see here a map of the United States that shows just how much longer the pollen season is across latitudes. This is uh, several years old. It was from 2005. And so these numbers are higher. And you can see that at higher latitudes, the lengthening of pollen season is actually greater than um, at some of the lower latitudes. So this leads to multiple factors that can impact health. And uh, we did some surveying of physicians. And this was a quote from a pulmonary doctor uh, uh, in the Northwest who said that uh, he was seeing children with asthma who are having more frequent symptoms and exacerbations due to poor air quality, um, high allergen counts, rental living accommodations with visual mold, living in areas with high winds and fires. Uh, the, another impact of climate change uh, because of the changes in the weather and the humidity are the spread of ticks and mosquitoes. Um, and um, this is the story of Dr. Nitin Domle who was um, a, uh, who's an internist in Rhode Island, who said that he and his partners in the practice used to see two to three patients a month who had Lyme disease. Um, this was several years ago, and now they see more like 40 to 50 every season, um, and the Lyme disease season is longer, um, and people are spending more, out, more time outside and are more exposed, and that's because of the, uh, that the, the winter is actually less severe than it used to be. This is uh, a map that shows the change in the distribution of Lyme disease over a 14 year period. And uh, this is six years ago now. And so the spread has gone even further. This shows West Nile virus and how neuroinvasive uh, uh, West Nile virus has spread from 2010 to 2013. It's the dark areas that have the highest rates of neuroinvasive cases. Um, and you can see that the number of dark areas has increased. So there's another problem that occurs because of the warming planet, and that's uh, extreme weather events, because warm water holds more moisture, uh, and this moisture in the atmosphere tends to fall as torrential rain. And the number of torrential rain events that happen every year has increased uh, pretty dramatically. So this is the story of Dr. Claude Tellies, who is a critical care physician in Louisiana, now retired. He was living in Baton Rouge uh, in 2016 when they had one of these thousand year flood events. Um, it rained about 20 inches in a fairly short period of time and uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of people, 30,000 people had to be uh, rescued and 10,000 ended up in shelters. And he worked with other physicians to get medications to patients who um, had left their medicines at home when they were evacuated. So the physicians and the pharmacies collaborated and uh, helped out the people who needed the medications. Um, months later, there were still pieces of homes and appliances that were piled up on the curbs that hadn't yet been cleared away. 
Uh, it took uh, a very long time for the community to recover from all this. And he was told by teachers in the local schools that every time it rained, uh, there were some children who became extremely afraid, worried that um, it was going to flood again. And, and this illustrates something about the mental health impacts of climate change, which are very real and uh, affect adults as well as children and can cause substance abuse and have been implicated in domestic violence and other problems. So some Americans face greater risk because of climate change. Um, and uh, while any American can be harmed, those who face greater risk include children who spend more time outside, pregnant women who it turns out are more sensitive to heat and to poor air quality and have higher rates of premature uh, deliveries when both, uh, in both conditions elderly individuals who are more vulnerable to the heat, people with chronic illnesses and allergies, and people with limited resources who find it more difficult to get out of harm's way. So uh, this is a report that uh, our organization, the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health has produced. Um, and we're now 29 medical societies that have a joint membership of over 60% of the docs in America. And we're also 48 affiliated public health groups. And our mission is to inform the public and policymakers about how climate change is harming our health and how climate solutions can improve it. Um, and the most important solutions are to embrace clean renewable energy and energy efficiency, to move towards zero carbon transportation. And not only will these improve our health, uh, the, they will protect the climate and improve our health because the air will be cleaner and the water will be cleaner. Uh, eating food and agriculture also matter and uh, we can go meatless or observe meatless Mondays since agriculture produces about 10% of greenhouse gases. Most of that is from the production of cattle. Um, and we can draw carbon out of the air by planting a trillion trees and also by improving soil health. So these will all lead to better health. Clean energy creates less soot, less pollution, healthier air, active transportation uh, is good for your health. Diets with more vegetables and less meat are healthier and cities with more trees and cooling greenery absorb more carbon dioxide and help protect people from the heat. We have a, um, a, a policy prescription, which you can find at climatehealthaction.org. It's a 10 point plan for addressing climate change. Most of the points are also beneficial to health. Uh, we can eat and move for wellness and sustainability. Um, and uh, here are some images that depict uh, some of the things that we can be doing to protect ourselves and others from climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mona. That was fabulous. I am happy to introduce our next speaker, Tonga Turner, who will present Revolt, Civil Rights, A Social Determinant of Health. Ms. Turner serves as the director of Kaiser Permanente's Community Health Division, where she oversees the company's access and social health investment portfolio. In her role, she develops and executes the access and social health strategy, which focuses on changing policy, systems and environments in communities that experience inequities around access to health care. Tonga also is responsible for the safety net partnerships and charitable care and coverage program, which includes Medicaid. Welcome, Tonga. Thank you. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These are the famous words of the Declaration of Independence signed on July 4th, 1776. Yet on this day, under these words, there were still men and women from the African descent who had been stripped of their ability to lead healthy and prosperous lives and in fact were not viewed or treated as equal. You see, at the time the Declaration of Independence was written, Many African Americans did not have the unalienable rights and were still being treated as property, being marginalized and brutalized because of their color. Almost 200 years after the Declaration of Independence was written in the 1960s, activists like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. were still fighting to ensure African Americans would get access to the basic human rights that were mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. The civil rights movement and the protests that ensued before and after all led to the signing of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which outlawed racial discrimination in the United States. 
So now that I've given everyone a, a little bit of a refresher on our nation's history, let's get down to the matter at hand. Are civil rights in fact connected to the social determinants of health? The answer to that question is quite simple, yes. Civil rights laws and their enforcement are social determinants of health because they affect one abil one's ability to lead and achieve health, wealth, and well-being. The social determinants of health are mentioned in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, not passively, but are addressed directly. Education, housing, transportation, employment, and even the system of justice affects the societal distribution of resources that in turn affect our health. The Civil Rights Act gives assurance of equal access to social opportunities regardless of race. For example, the equitable access to education mm -hmm. is essential to one's health. So studies show that the development and acquisition of educational knowledge opens up other doors in society, such as better paying jobs and careers. Yet history shows that the lack of access to quality education has plagued the black and brown community for decades, as shown in the case of Brown versus the Board of Education. The location and condition of housing, access to community resources, including transportation, food, recreation and employment, as well as basic conditions of shelter, all have impact on health outcomes. The point that I'm trying to make is that civil rights and the social determinants of health, such as healthcare, education, employment, and housing are interconnected, not separate and apart. All of these social components of the Civil Rights Act are mutually benef beneficial when in place together and are mutually harmful when unenforced and or enforced separately. I would argue to say this, health disparities are a demonstration of society and our health system failing to enforce the Civil Rights Act in its entirety. But there's another more complicated question and that is, are public health leaders leading change through a revolt, which can be defined as an episodic push for change that does not always result in long-term change or are we truly in fact revolutionizing public health? Next slide. A social movement that only is merely a revolt, a movement that changes both people and institutions is a revolution. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. What made the civil rights movement powerful? What made it not just a moment in time, a revolt, but a moment to last a lifetime, a revolution? Well, there were three components that made the civil rights movement powerful. These components made the mo movement truly a revolution. I like to call them the three Ps. Next slide. The three things that made the civil rights movement powerful were partners with power, planning with purpose, and pounding the pavement. The first is partners with power. Leaders in the civil rights movement like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., James Farmer, who was the co-founder of the Congress of Racial Equity, Baynard Rustin, Deputy Director for the March on Washington, and Whitney Young, Executive Director of the National Urban League, were all partners with power. You see, these partners in power, as I call them, pull together their networks, their resources, and their influence towards one common goal, changing the racist and oppressive system to achieve equality for African Americans. As public health, leader, as public health leaders, who are our partners with power? Who are the people and institutions that we are partnering with that have the influence and power to make true change. The second component is planning with the purpose. The civil rights movement was a movement that was comprised of a vast network of interconnected groups and individuals ranging from church groups to business owners to college students, bus drivers, seniors, moms, dads, all of them melded together to achieve a common purpose. Despite these many different stakeholders, they were organized and every plan, every decision was executed with a purpose. Are we as public health leaders planning with a purpose? Are we galvanizing, elevating, and coordinating our collective community and leadership voices towards a common purpose? The last P is pounding the pavement. Between 1960 and 1964, there were over a thousand marches, walks, sit-ins, boycotts, and freedom rides. Some of the most famous we all know about, Selma Montgomery March and the March on Washington. All of these were examples where Activists both figuratively and literally pounded the pavement together, making their voices heard in a collective manner. When was the last march as public health leaders we have led? Before George Floyd was senselessly murdered, COVID-19 had killed more black and brown people in just two months than all of the police shootings of black and brown men and women last year. 
Yet we did not organize a public health march against the system that have perpetuated the very health disparities that have given room for the COVID-19 pandemic to disproportionately impact black and brown communities. Remember I said something earlier that civil rights and the social determinants of health are interconnected and are not separate and apart. And so we as public health leaders should challenge ourselves to respond with the same fervor when the social determinant components of the Civil Rights Act are violated. What is a movement that you or I or our organizations have led or participated in specifically around equity? When is the last time we pounded the pavement for health equity? Next slide. So I just wanna say this, there's really no right or wrong answer to these questions. Some of you may be doing one and not the other, and there may be who are doing all three. Whatever your answer is, take into consideration this. Can we be doing more? Could we be doing something different? I'd like to share a quote from Kaiser Permanente's former president and CEO, Bernard J. Tyson. He said, don't ask for permission to help improve the lives of the people and communities you've pledged to serve. Instead, march through the doors of red tape and make bold moves and usher in access. I'd like to share an example of how the three Ps of executed well can lead to a modern day public health revolution. I'll set the stage. In 2015, Freddie Gray, 25 year old African American man was killed under the arrest while he was under the arrest by the Baltimore City Police Department. And the city of Baltimore went up in flames. The community was enraged. But this single act of rioting was a revolt. It took leaders from across many organizations to turn the community's voice into a revolution. And in order to do so, they sought out partners in power, working with elected officials, key private sector leaders, and the like. They planned with the purpose, working and organizing with community leaders, business owners like barbershops and beauty salon owners. And indeed, they pounded the pavement, hosting multiple community conversations, community events, and leveraged opportunities to collectively raise their voices. Let's take a look at this video. New Beginnings is not just the barbershop or my barbershop. No, this barbershop belongs to this community. And everybody is welcome. This is a quintessential definition of the community's barbershop because you can come in here and stay for hours. You can come in here and educate yourself. You can come in here for advice. Oh, it is family. It is family. We've, we've cried together. We've laughed together. We've watched our children grow. We have major health issues here. That's a problem. So, you know, say, oh, let's, let's find a solution to this. That's when the merger comes with Kaiser and New Beginnings. Well, I'm excited when I come here because this is an awesome opportunity for healthcare to come to a community in need. So the individual comes into the barbershop and the barber says, well, hey, have you had your blood pressure check? When last time you had a flu shot? Uh, didn't you say, have a sugar that means, well, what about getting your blood glucose checked here? And Kaiser was willing to partner and come up in um, healthcare screening and a warm and inviting atmosphere. So growing up in Baltimore was tough. You know, going, growing up in a neighborhood where there weren't a lot of resources, you know, it helped inspire me to want to be able to give back to the community that gave me enough to be able to succeed in life. Baltimore. Baltimore's a beautiful place. I love my city. I am Baltimore. Let's not revolt. Let's not have just a simple moment in time. Let's be leaders in the revolution, changing the history books for a lifetime. Recognizing that civil rights and the social determinants of health are in fact interconnected together and not separate and apart. Let's stop treating them that way. As public health leaders, I challenge us to uphold both recognizing that the Civil Rights Act and the social determinants of health partners on the journey to equality for all. 
The revolution is important. Next slide. Again, I wanna just emphasize that the work that we do is critical and it's the work that each and every one of us have upholded in the public health sector. Again, let's not revolt. Let's make this more than just a simple moment in time, but one for the history books a lifetime. Equality and racial equity is important and it's a key component to ensuring that social, justice and social determinants of health are addressed for everyone. The revolution starts now. I challenge us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tonga, for that really uh, powerful presentation on health equity uh, in America. It's going to be a really uh, important issue um, moving forward. Our next speaker that we have today and our last speaker um, for the series uh, is Ms. Catherine Fry, and her title is Advocacy in a Time of Upheaval. Kate Fry currently serves as the Chief Executive Officer for America's Blood Centers, North America's largest network of community-based independent blood programs. A recognized leader in healthcare association management and advocacy, Kate heads ABC strategy development and advocacy work before legislators, regulators, and strategic partners, promoting the importance of blood donation and a safe and robust blood supply as a national priority. She is a fellow Mason MBA alum. Please welcome Ms. Kate Fry. Thanks, Evan. Um, and Nick and Katie, I wasn't sure if you saw my message about my slides. I did not, Kate, I can advance those. Um, if you just give me one moment. Uh, okay, you thanks. Presentation, I'll pull those so, up for you. Yep, I'll go ahead and get started. So thanks for having me here today. Um, I will say I started this job at America's Blood Centers the same week that I started my MBA program. Um, and I had little you know, knowledge at that time how interchanged the two would end up becoming. Uh, and how much the MBA program would set me up for this role. And so the blood industry is a really interesting mix of public health in terms of the safety of the blood supply and our role with infectious disease, uh, manufacturing in terms of the ability to take a raw product that we get from a blood donor um, and make it into various blood components. We ultimately get that out to hospitals. And then finally, disaster and emergency planning. Uh, because blood has to be tested um, and, and takes a while to get manufactured, we always have to have enough blood on the shelf today for whatever may happen tomorrow and the day after. Um, and so it's this really interesting niche industry um, that's actually fairly unique. So I thought I would start out with just a few facts about the blood supply. So first of all, the U.S. system here is really unique within our counterparts um, among the world. Uh, we are really the only developed country that has a privatized blood supply um, that is, is fragmented in, in many ways. Um, so a lot of countries obviously have national health systems, and so their blood supply is part of that, or they might have just one primary uh, blood supplier. Here in the U.S., we have more than 50 not-for-profit 501c3 um, organizations, most of which our rep organization represents. Um, that really are responsible for the more than 11 million blood transfusions that have to happen each year. And so to do this, we also you know, are unique in that as a manufacturer, really, industry. Uh, we don't control our raw product. We have to rely on more than 7 million blood donors um, around the country to, to come in and donate each year uh, to produce what's needed. And so it's a great industry, but it's not one without challenges. Right now, we're really struggling. Less than 5% of all Americans donate blood. Uh, and so we're especially challenged with our young donors. We just aren't seeing the levels of donation among young generations that we saw in the generations preceding them. And we also struggle with diversity. It's important that we have a donor base um, of the patients that we have to give blood products to. And so it's an industry that's really an, um, in, a, uh, in a time of change, I would say. And we're seeing a lot of these issues um, even highlighted more during COVID. And so I wanted to tell that story just a little bit right now. Uh, next slide. So um, I can kind of explain what this slide is. So we have daily inventory um, tracking for how much blood is on any shelf um, and, and total among all the blood centers around the country. And so ideally, we like to be in three to five days 
of available blood in this country that's for those emergency needs. If we have a, a shooting, a hurricane, whatever it might be, we would have enough blood to treat um, that situation and then continue with the regular blood, blood products that we know are necessary. Um, unfortunately, during a lot of times a year, uh, we see that drop way below where we would like to. And so the start of this year, January, February, which is fairly typical, yellow to red kind of stoplight area that we, we definitely don't want to be in, where we had uh, really less than two days of available supply of blood across the country. And so we were already in a precarious position then when COVID happened. And when COVID happened, we really found ourselves in an unprecedented situation. For the first time, really the history of this country, uh, we found that the blood supply was about to be at risk of collapse. Uh, and this was um, due majority because of the cancellation of blood drives. So we rely very heavily in this country on school-based blood drives, whether they be at high schools or at the college level, um, and also businesses to host blood drives for us. And so really in the matter of almost 48 hours, uh, more than 12,000 blood drives canceled across the country uh, with more than 300,000 lost donations that we had scheduled for the coming weeks and months. And so uh, it was a, a frantic situation we didn't want to be in, but it was a great opportunity to show us that we are far more nimble and creative um, as, as individuals and as companies and organizations than I think we often think of. And so we quickly gathered our full industry. We partnered with our government, um, the government stakeholders involved, the Surgeon General, HHS, FDA, et cetera, um, and got the word out that it was still safe to donate blood. So that was the third kind of factor. We had those loss of schools, we had the loss of businesses, and then we had people being told to, to stay home. Um, and so we quickly had to get that word out that it's safe to donate blood and it remained an essential activity. And so you can see the green, you can see the effect that that had, that public messaging that we were able to get out, where all of a sudden, uh, we had this incredible response from the American public, and thank you to anybody on the line that was part of that response. You truly saved lives by coming out to donate. Uh, but then we, we had a situation where we had a lot of blood, but we couldn't process our donors as much as quickly as we thought we'd be able to because we were social distancing at that point in time. So we, could, we couldn't have large blood drives. We had to space out our donors and our donor centers. Uh, and so that was a tricky spot. And then one of the really hard things about blood it has a shelf life. So platelets are only, uh, you can only use for five days after a date of donation. Red blood cells, you can only use for 42 days after a donation. So while we had this incredible response, uh, really a month or so later, uh, we saw ourselves right back in the same situation. And that's really where we're at today is we're trying to find a new normal as this industry for how we're going to continue to get uh, and, and supply blood for patients in need throughout the pandemic. Next slide. And so, like I said, um, and so really that's the concern now is looking ahead to the fall. We know that about 30% of our nation's blood supply comes from schools um, during certain times of year. And so with so many schools now announcing that they're not going to reopen, even the ones that are reopening in some kind of modified fashion, uh, we are forced to find new creative ways to try to find those donors and transition them to a different kind of donation. And so we're really viewing this as a fundamental shift in this country. We're really the only country that has a B2B model for blood donation rather than a B2C, the, the business to consumer, and that we use these intermediaries to host blood drives. And so we're looking at this as a great opportunity to transition some of that. Next slide. I did want to mention um, one other dual uh, mission that's going on within our industry right now, one that we never thought we would be in for certain, um, is the collection of convalescent plasma. And so convalescent plasma itself is not a new uh, concept. We've been using convalescent plasma for decades now for patients in need in various scenarios. Obviously, COVID-19 convalescent plasma is very different, um, and not only in the product, but then also in the scope of the effort that's going on. Right now, it's really one of three identified ways by the administration, it's three identified uh, therapies, I should say, that we have right now to treat COVID-19 patients um, that are severely ill or, or even moderately ill. And so the concept behind it is, excuse me, is that you have uh, patient or patients that have built up antibodies to COVID-19 um, that we can then take those antibodies, we can uh, have them donate them in the form of plasma, 
uh, and then we can transfuse that plasma to patients that are currently ill um, with the hope that it will help boost their immune systems and help them fight the virus. And so this program started back in March. I would say at the time we thought we might need five to 10,000 units of convalescent plasma uh, to fulfill our need throughout the pandemic. Where we are today is we have our member centers, I should say, have collected more than 70,000 units of convalescent plasma for COVID-19 patients. Um, and we're working very closely. This has now been elevated to part of Operation Warp Seed within the administration. Um, ABC, my organization, has a contract actually with HHS to help spearhead this effort at the national level. And so now uh, we are expecting to collect and distribute another 200,000 doses beyond what has already been done just by the mid-September to the mid to late September. So um, this is truly one of those situations where as an industry, you have to pivot to what's needed and what's necessary. And I give a lot of kudos to our members for all the work that they have done uh, to be able to support not only ongoing patient needs, but also this new uh, need for convalescent plasma. So um, just in terms of lessons learned last slide, uh, you know, nimble is the new normal. I know we're hearing that a lot, but it's certainly been true in our case. And like I said, we are far more agile and able as individuals, but I think we often give ourselves credit for if we find the partnerships and we find the opportunities and lean in to some of these challenges that we've been talking about today. So uh, I'd be remiss not to say, please go donate blood if you're able. Uh, and it really does save a life. Every donation can save up to three individuals' lives. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kate. That was a terrific uh, commentary around the blood supply and uh, the importance of donating blood, especially in times of pandemic. Uh, if I can have um, all of our speakers uh, turn back their cameras on and we'll, um, we'll begin the Q&A portion. Unfortunately, we only have um, a few minutes left uh, in our event here. Um, so what we're gonna do, I guess, is um, we'll ask a, a really broad critical question um, that kind of gets to the root of why we uh, hosted today's series and I kind of want to get feedback from from all of our speakers here um, and this was a question that was also posed uh, in the Q&A box. Um, the question is for all panelists, if you had to choose one, what is the one change in policy, education, or business that you believe would improve America's health landscape the most? And we can go in order if, if you'd like, or when you keep shaking your head. Uh, I answered it in the, uh, on the Q&A. So I guess I, I think realistically ensuring high quality medical care, which doesn't risk bankrupting Americans, is kind of the first thing that you need to do. Uh, because if people are putting off going to get treatment, then we know that the costs of treatment exponentially rise. It's, it's a hockey stick. Uh, which means you have an overburdened system, which is now overburdened and more overburdened. And those are usually people who are unable to pay. Um, and so until you align the financial systems, it's, it's not going to work. Now, I think somebody invariably is going to say, well, why is economics entering the equation in the first place? That's, that's a very reasonable counterpoint to raise. Uh, and I think if there's going to be a long-term discussion trying to get, uh, trying to minimize the financial incentives, it is something that also needs to be discussed, but that's that's a that's a ten year goal rather than a a, a right now goal. Uh, I would uh, recommend that we reach uh, we set the policy goal of reaching carbon neutrality by twenty thirty five, um, and uh, that means embracing clean energy in every sphere and uh, um, and doing it in a very determined national way with a national program the way that Virginia is doing. Um, at a state level and other states are doing at a state level. Um, according to the World Health Organization, over 60% of health outcomes are a result of social determinants of health. Um, things like economic security, food insecurity, housing stability. These are all social risk factors in people's lives and they create really significant impact in their health outcomes. So, you know, one of the things I would say is to act on social risk organizations, health systems, public health entities, academic institutions really need to incorporate and look at the social determinants of health as part of an infrastructure problem and really address the issue um, sort of as an underlying cause and not an after, a, a afterthought. 
Um, we have to be able to look across the populations and communities that we serve and really quantify the impacts so they can create sustainable strategies. You know, we have to talk about it again, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, as not a separate and apart thing from really what I would consider a really a civil rights issue um, and really think about it as a collective issue that addresses not just racial equity, but really equity, society equity and human rights as well. So I think we really need to put that into practice in all of the areas that address public health practices. Um, this is Monique. So in addition to what Tonko was just talking about, I'll just put in a plug for science. You know, science is what's going to get us out of this pandemic and science will get us out of the antibiotic crisis that's coming. Uh, we need the social sciences as Tonga was talking about, but we also really need a serious appreciation for science and investigation and all the fundamental uh, research infrastructure that provides new researchers, new drugs, new therapies and also better social scientists to help solve some of these, uh, you know, social and racial disparities that we are seeing every day and dealing with things like uh, diabetes, which all contribute to infectious disease problems as well. And this is Sharon, I would just add all of the panelists had terrific suggestions that additional policy is access and affordability, good quality health care. Um, that doesn't just include pharmaceuticals, but also coordinated care, working closely with healthcare providers to make sure patients know why they're doing what they're doing, why they're taking what they're taking. Um, but definitely uh, appreciate the other comments and couldn't agree more. Thanks. Rod or Kate, any, uh, any input on um, the one policy or education or business aspect that you would wanna change? to uh, help improve America's health landscape? Well, I, I mean, it touched on it in my comments, um, Evan. I do believe virtual care has to be one of the main tenets of those discussions. I think, um, as I noted, telehealth is an office visit replacement, um, remote patient monitoring, monitoring what the patients do in between office visits, right? And if you could address obesity, COPD, CHF, asthma, diabetes, that drives so much impact and cost into the healthcare uh, uh, ecosystem. Um, you know, understanding um, what they are, establishing those thresholds, and those vitals begin to get outside those thresholds with notifications, right? So you can pre preactive, proactively treat and, and, and monitor and engage before a 911 call, before an ambulatory care is dispatched, before they're in, a, in an intensive care unit, right, an ER unit. Um, I think it's got to be part of the discussion. Well, great. Um, so that's all the time we have today for this series. Um, we uh, hope to continue it um, next year um, and, you know, provide a new, uh, new insights from, from the Mason Nation and all of, all of the experts that we uh, have in, you know, in our community um, to address the um, next question. Um, we'll be sending out a survey um, at the end of the, um, the event here, so everybody who's uh, attended, if you could please provide your valuable input, um, you know, and if you have any suggestions for topics that you would like our series to address, you know, we're always open to, um, to creating the, the events that you find the most valuable. Dean Piper. Uh, thanks, Evan, and uh, Nikki and Katie and, and all the speakers. In fact, let's give a virtual round of applause uh, for our speakers. Well done, everyone. I know I learned a lot, and uh, I'm... I'm fascinated by these things anyway. So we got some really, really uh, useful information and, and things to do as a result, which is what it's about. It's about the impact. Thanks for uh, coming. Thanks for filling in the survey, bringing us out on social media, hashtag Mason Nation Impact. And we will have the recording and YouTube link. You'll all get it uh, shortly. So a great pleasure to join you. And uh, thank you to our great, all seven of our great speakers and to my colleagues. And we look forward to seeing you again. All the best.